United Healthcare Coalition of Texans with Disabilities, Raise Your Voice 2020 Advocate Connection Program, September 2nd, 2020, voting. Good afternoon, my fellow Texans. Um, again, my name is Roger DeLeon. I do community relations for AmeriGroup Texas. Uh, so I want to physically describe myself for those that are visually impaired. Uh, I'm a Hispanic male in my mid 40s. Uh, speak English and Spanish, and I'm a little Tex-Mex. Uh, I'm wearing a light pole style shirt, and sitting in, in, I'm sitting, and right behind me, I have a, an American signage as my backdrop. So, um, just want to take a few moments to say the words. Uh, so we, we at AmeriGroup are very committed to ensuring people with disabilities are supported to live independently, uh, self dependent lives, promote self-advocacy. Uh, so it's very important to us uh, these round table, that these roundtable discussions for uh, advocates to engage in the future of disability rights. Uh, we support person-centered practices and inclusive strategies for all people. Uh, we hope that you are moved into advocacy through these meaningful Raise your voice roundtable discussions. Again, we thank you, our fellow Texans, uh, for giving us a merit group uh, to be part of your community. Without further ado, I would like to introduce introduce you to Mr. Chase Bearding, and on with the show. Hi, and thank you, Roger, for all your years of support. Uh, my name is Chase Bearden. I'm the deputy director of the Coalition of Texans with Disabilities. A lot of the work I get to work on is a lot of times voting and some of the other issues, but for this session, upcoming legislative session and during this period up to the elections, voting has become one of my uh, bigger priorities. I'm a white male for audio description for those of you that are just on the phone. Uh, I use a wheelchair. I'm a C56 quadriplegic and I have blonde hair. I'm sitting in our guest bedroom, which is not that exciting for those of you watching. Um, I'm going to cut my introduction short and put up on the screen a poll. And the reason we're going to launch this poll is we just want to get an idea of how people are planning on voting this go around. So go ahead. I'm going to read it to you. Um, how do you plan to cast your ballot in the November election? And you can click on multiple choice. The first choice is a mail-in ballot. And do you typically use that mail-in ballot? Uh, the second choice is mail-in ballot, and this will be your first time using a mail-in ballot. Third choice is I will be early voting at a polling location. Uh, fourth choice is I plan to vote on election day at a polling location. The fifth one is I plan to use curbside voting. The sixth one is not sure yet, and the seventh is something else. For those of you that might not be able to see this screen or you're just on the phone call, we will have the ability for y'all at the end, an email that'll go out that'll allow you to answer this. It kind of just gives us an idea of how people are planning to vote. So we can also work a little harder in those areas. And I'll leave that up for a second while I turn it over to Dennis and let him do his intro. Thanks. Thanks, Chase. I'm Dennis Borrell with the Coalition of Texans with Disabilities. I am an Anglo male. I am a uh, Got a lot of gray going on, gray hair, gray beard, trimmed. Uh, so I look like, you know, Bob Kafka's younger days, I would like to say. Uh, in the background, I actually have a, uh, a virtual background in the front of the CTD building. And it even has a uh, blue sky, which is not the case now. I can hear the rain pounding on the roof down here. Actually, very cool, very cool. So the Coalition of Texans with Disabilities, for those of you who don't know us, everybody calls us CTD, those initials. We are cross disability, which means people of all ages, of all disabilities, we advocate for. And frankly, voting is an excellent example of a cross disability issue that crosses all categories. We're primarily an advocacy organization, working in the state capital, the legislature with the state agencies. Two of our most core principles are to involve self-advocates and to get input from the community, which is why we're doing this today. This is actually our, our um, fourth, fourth or fifth Raise Your Voice event. 
today, uh, next Wednesday at two o'clock, we'll be doing one on the topic of the adult dental benefit in Medicaid. And on the 23rd, we'll be uh, doing one on reform in medical cannabis. We will be taking off September the 16th to recognize Dies Essays, a civil rights holiday. Um, so what you can expect, we will value you, we will listen to you, and we will involve you. We will share information with you. Some of it may be on the processes of legislation or an appropriation. Some of it may be more detailed backgrounds and issues, and we will listen to you. You'll work with other self-advocates, and you'll share your ideas and experiences. We do have uh, four people on our staff that will be doing advocacy work, Chase, myself, Jolene, and, and Jen. And we, were, we are here to collaborate with you, not to lead, but to collaborate with you. And where are we going with all this? The answer is January 2021, the 2021 legislative session. We don't know what that's going to look like. Nobody knows what it's going to look like now. Today, you cannot walk in the Capitol. You cannot enter it. What will happen in January, we don't know yet. But we will not back off from advocacy, nor should you. So uh, given that, let's see, moving on to, on to, we have an outstanding guest, actually one of the founders of CTD from 1978, um, truly an icon in the disability rights movement, Bob Kafka. So Bob, take it from here. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, uh, I'm a, uh, a white male with uh, much longer white hair than Dennis Burrell has. I have a much frizzier beard, um, blue shirt, and I would like to think I'm better looking, but uh, you know that's up to you know the eyes of the beholder. Um, I really first want to thank CTD for putting on these issue uh, sessions. Uh, one of the things that is really important as we go into this next election is to be educated on the issues. And I'm here today representing uh, Rev Up. Uh, most of you may know me as an Adaptive Texas organizer, uh, but we created a separate nonprofit called Rev Up. Uh, the acronym stands for Register educate, vote, use your power. And uh, I want to just show a, a, a quick minute and five second uh, PSA that we use that I think just kind of uh, encapsulates what the goals of RevUp is, and then I'll get into a little bit more detail when we come back. Square images of posters and leaders of the rights movement fall into a pattern. John Hoffman and others with Tom Wilson holding a flag. Deborah Jackson holding a poster. Vote as if your life depends on it, because it does. Justin Dart. Chris Goad holds a poster. Label jars, not people. Power concedes nothing without a demand. Adapt. James Payne holds a poster. Bob Kafka. Hands spell vote in ASL. Larry Hughes holds the Rev Up poster. Sandra Petty, Stephen Ty. I change the world when I vote. You change the world when you vote. And we change the world when we vote together. The square images fill in the space to form the words Rev Up. Register, educate, vote. Use your power. Make the disability vote count. www.revuptexas.org. You know, that short um, PSA that is available and you can use it in your local community sort of encapsulates what, you know, RevUp is about in terms of, and I, the way it began uh, was when our current governor was first running for the position. Um, we had always, most of the groups individually had gotten together and did various different things. And I realized 
that you know everybody had some really good information and so thought that if we could bring all this stuff together, not duplicate what other groups are doing, but build on it and create another nonprofit that would be focused on voting, uh, that was really necessary. And so uh, that was the impetus. Uh, a coalition of groups got together. C2D was one of the founding and really was one of the big supporters, but also the Arc of Texas, the Texas State Independent Living Council. Texas Parent to Parent, the Texas Advocates all came together and we held the first Texas Disability Issues Forum. Uh, and again, that's where we invited uh, both Democratic and Republican. And I want to emphasize to those of you uh, who may be representing organizations that are 501c3, RevUp is nonpartisan. What we focus on are issues. Uh, again, if one party happens to be supportive of those issues, uh, you know, we support those candidates. But the, the whole intent is to build the fact that there is such a thing as the disability vote. You know, sometimes in the disability community, we talk to ourselves. We think if we throw out the number, you know, 5.2 million people with disabilities, that's going to scare them, you know, in terms of that. But really what is necessary is to do what other civil rights groups have done. It's really necessary for grassroots organizing. And in Texas, it really is a challenge because, you know, local organizing in the state, this large is really difficult. And, you know, the cultures are different. The uh, whole service array is different and people are experiencing things. So getting out the message about that, you know, so again, we have focused on things first, obviously you need to register to vote. Um, the last day to register to vote in Texas is October the 5th. Again, uh, and it has been difficult to do traditional voter registration job uh, drives, uh, obviously because COVID-19. But there's a simple way that if you're not registered or you want to do a campaign in your local community, by going to the website www.register2vote.org. Again, what that does is it's an online submittal. You send it in, you submit it. They then will send you a filled out uh, voter registration card with the, uh, a postage paid envelope with the correct address to go and register. You can use that not only to uh, register, but you can also use that same www register the number two vote.org. You can do that um, to do any change of address. And so for those in the audience who represent organizations or you have a network uh, that you can outreach, uh, we are really encouraging you to you know, disseminate that. Um, the July 13th to 17th was National Disability Voter Registration Week, but what is coming up and something you can focus on and Rev Up will be doing campaign is National Voter Registration Day. And that is going to be September the 22nd. Uh, that is just a nationwide, not just disability, uh, where groups, nonpartisan groups, have come together all over the country to promote, you know, turnout in this election. And I just want to emphasize that in this very, very contentious atmosphere, turnout is what's going to win the election. There may be difficulty in changing people's mind. Um, so that is the register. The education, we're also doing issue education, uh, the CTD, Raise Your Voice is very helpful 
in terms of educating people on some of the issues, uh, but there is a lot of resources that we have on the RevUp website in terms of that. And then voting. Okay, two things. One, uh, if you plan to vote in person, I encourage you to vote early. That's October 13th to the 30th and encourage everybody you know, because November 3rd may be long lines if you wait to do that. And with COVID-19, you, you don't know what to expect in terms of you know, contagion. And if you want to vote by mail, absentee or mail-in, you know, people use them interchangeably, uh, please request your application for a mail-in ballot if you haven't done it before. Because in Texas, it, we have one of the most restrictive mail-in ballot processes. You know, there's only three reasons that you can vote by mail in law. One, if you have a disability, if you're over 65, or if you're out of the county or the country. Um, so those are the three. And disability is defined, you know, sort of loosely, but our attorney general has put some restrictions that just the fear of COVID-19 is not a justification for checking the ballot. But if you do want to mail in ballot, I also encourage apply for it today, encourage people in your community to apply for it today. And when you get it, fill it out and turn it in that day or the next day at the latest. Again, uh, you've seen all the news stories about, um, you know, the US Postal Service being inundated and things not getting there in time. If you want to make sure that the Texas disability vote is influential and your vote will count, uh, I really want to, you know, encourage you to join what we're in RevUp we're calling the I Vote Early campaign. Uh, and there's in information at the end of my presentation uh, where you can get on the website and there are a bunch of resources. So um, I think I'll leave it there. Uh, our next uh, uh, rev up meeting is a Zoom meeting on September the 10th. And if you want information uh, about that, please contact me at revuptx at gmail.com and give you the information about the upcoming rev up meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. This is Chase. I um, want to thank you all for all the work y'all are doing with rev up and really doing your best to reach out and get new voters and also make sure that people understand all the rules and regulations. First, I wanted to share the poll results for you. Part of the reason we did this is it gives us an idea of where people are thinking. Um, we have a lot of work to ensure that accessibility across the board from no matter how you vote, being at a polling site or uh, using a mail-in ballot or curbside is the most accessible option no matter what. We want to make sure that every option is available to everyone. So for us, the, the poll results, and I'll go ahead and let you know for those of you on the phone, uh, for the first time mail-in ballots, uh, it was 19%. Uh, for those using mail-in ballot that typically use a mail-in ballot, it's 14%. Uh, 48% of people will be early voting and um, let's see 5% will be voting on election day. I strongly support uh, or suggest making sure you get there early if you're planning on voting on election day. 5% um, are looking at using curbside voting. Make sure you've called ahead of time so that you know the number you need and there are 10% who still aren't sure. So that kind of gives us an idea of where we're heading and I want to go into some of the issues we've been working on. CTD, along with some of the other groups, some that are on the call right now, have been in two pieces of different litigation against the state to improve voter rights. A uh, majority of these have come up very quickly as we've been dealing with COVID and seeing how many in the disability community are using a mail-in ballot for the first time or maybe the second time because they did were able to in the primary. 
I myself had never used the process. And until we started working through it, I didn't realize how many issues around accessibility there were in that. So a big portion of what we've done in working with some of these other groups, the first piece of litigation we're in is looking at the signatures and signature identification and matching. So the state of Texas, when your mail-in ballot comes in, if it, the envelope where you've signed the outside doesn't match the signature they have on file, it gets tossed aside. It doesn't get used. You won't find out until 10 days after the election. So you have no way of actually curing your vote and having a chance to correct that. We brought to their attention that many in the disability community, those who are aging or maybe in the hospital, may have lost some use of their dexterity and their ability to sign using a different type of pen on a different surface can do the same thing. I know when I originally signed my voter registration, I was trying to do it on a table up high and I can guarantee the signature probably doesn't match how I sign things now. Um, one of the issues too that we'll talk about in interim charges is on signatures. Um, so part of what we're doing is trying to find a way to get the state to look at signature verification in the committees, the people who are doing it, and find some kind of recourse to give everyone a chance to um, cure their ballot if it gets rejected. So the only advice we can give you right now is make sure every time you sign your name on the ballot or on the ballot envelope that you try and match as closely as possible how you originally signed. If you need to set up books and make it uh, exactly the way you did it beforehand, make sure you do that. The other piece of the litigation we're in right now is working with um, ACBT and others on making sure ballots are fully accessible. Uh, for many, when you get an electronic ballot, or you don't get an electronic ballot, when you get your mail-in ballot or your absentee ballot in the mail, there is no accessible format offered. It comes as is. So for those who can't read due to blindness or any other reason, print reason, they struggle with being able to have a private and secure ballot. It forces you to have to rely on other people, an assistant, someone to come in your home and help you fill out the ballot. That means you also have to trust them that they did it the way you wanted. And for us, the most secure ballot is one that you don't need assistance with. It's one that you get to vote the way you plan on voting without any kind of interference. So we are urging the Secretary of State's office and we have been moving through this process and in hopes that we can have this set up by November to allow people who want to request getting an electronic version of the ballot sent to them that they would then use similar to what the military or overseas people do to be able to click on an electronic link, download their ballot, fill it out using JAWS or any accessible format um, technology you use, then print it and send it back. Recently in Virginia, in the Commonwealth, they actually settled with the state and they are going to have it in place. I see Kenneth's arms going up uh, in place for the, the next election. So that was a huge win. There's other states that are now following suit. We just need Texas to get it done as quickly as possible and to at least allow for any of the counties who want to do it in the next election to have that opportunity to do for their citizens. Right now, the Secretary of State's office is not allowing any counties to do it. We've had counties tell us they, they are willing to try um, if they can get the green light. So we are working hard to get those issues done. Some of the other issues we're working on is coming up is the interim charges. There are two that we are looking at and that we plan on sending in information, and I'll read those quickly to y'all for those of you that don't have access to them. The House Committee on Elections on HB 4130, which requires the Secretary of State to develop procedures for adequately certifying electronic pool books, review the provision requiring the Secretary of State to adopt rules mandating real-time updates for electronic pool books, 
use during the early voting period or under the countywide polling place program, monitor and report on countywide polling, examine the numbers and location of polling places, polling booths, and waiting times. For us, we're going to submit comments in that area to try and ensure that people are looking at the accessibility of it. I've signed one of these electronic poll books at the time at a, at a poll site, and they had the cords tangled up. They couldn't get it close enough to me. So the person working there said, just make an X as best you can. Well, under the current program, that X would go into the system that would be on uh, as my signature. So later on, if I do a mail-in ballot and that doesn't match, then I start to have issues. So making sure no matter what, the way we do elections is that we try and be consistent across the board and ensure that one area of accessibility doesn't affect us in another portion of, of voting. So for us, we want to make sure that if your signature is going to be recorded, that you have the adequate ability to sign that. Um, the state Senate is going to also be doing an interim charge. This one I'll read out loud to you. Um, study the integrity and security of voter registration rolls, voting elections, uh, voting machines, and voter qualification procedures to reduce election fraud in Texas. Specifically, study and make recommendations to one, ensure counties are accurately verifying voter eligibility after voter registration. Two, improve training requirements for mail-in ballot signature verification committees. Three, ensure every voter has access to a polling station, particularly in counties that have adopted countywide polling. Four, allow the voter register, county clerk, and security secretary of state to suspend and unqualified voters registration or remove an ineligible voter from a list of registered voters. Five, ensure compliance with laws that prohibit school trustees and employees from improperly using funds to advocate for or against any candidate, measure, or political party. Now, all of those don't fit for what we want to have done. So we're gonna focus on the signature requirements for mail-in ballots and also bring to light the issues that people are having when you look at voter security and having to accept assistance. If we can make it to where people don't need assistance, their, their ballot is more secure. So we will work on those and our plan is to hopefully have feedback from you guys to add in there as we go. Uh, interim charge studies are being worked on as we go over the next month or two. So we wanna make sure to get those notes in soon. On another note, for us, our priorities for this upcoming legislative session are to ensure that blind voters and those with mobility impairments have access to mail-in ballots in a format that allows them to cast their vote privately and independently. That also includes having a sample ballot ahead of time that you can look at for every county and gives you the information you need to prepare for the election. The other priority is address the state's faulty policies around mail-in ballot signature verifications and ensure that voters have an opportunity to cure their ballots. And lastly, is to stop any bad legislation that could create barriers to anybody trying to vote and make it accessible. So last session, we had multiple bills come out that would have made it harder and created more barriers for the disability community. Our goal is to make sure that none of those get through and that we can work on making every piece of legislation something that will benefit all of us. Those are just the upfront priorities we're working on. I know there'll be more and as we listen to what y'all come up with, it'll allow us to work towards making sure we can meet those needs and get those put into the legislative session that's coming up. Uh, I want to tell you briefly that Chase is right. We want to listen to this because we haven't, we don't sit around and try to figure out what to do. We listen to you to figure out what kind of public policy changes need to be made. And to give you an example, the, our very first, um, our very first raise your voice, which was four ago, uh, you know, one of our uh, great leaders brought the question of uh, older individuals with blindness and how small that program was and 
And, uh, and we looked at that and said, you know what, that's right. And uh, we've since uh, circled back with that, that uh, advocate, self-advocate, and have, uh, you know, weighed in with the state agency that administers that. And uh, hats off to the self-advocate and his group for doing this, but I think it's also valuable when uh, like a, a CTD, for example, can back folks. And uh, so that, that's one that came from you all, came from the, the grassroots. Now I wanna mention also, of course, that um, this is a, there's no charge to any of these Raise Your Voice events, these round tables, and, uh, but there is a cost. So if you're wondering how on earth we're doing this for, for, for free, the answer is we have sponsors. And the sponsors are basically covering all the costs so we can do these. And we're, I think we're well on our way to doing quite a few. Uh, and uh, it's tremendously valuable. So, so who are those sponsors? You might be asking yourself, who are those sponsors? Well, they, they're at different levels, but at the silver level, sort of the uh, entry level is CareSource, Shield Healthcare, and MCNA. The next higher level sponsorship, the gold sponsors, the DentaQuest Partnership, AstraZeneca, and Amgen. Then on to the diamond levels, you know, of sponsors, Amerigroup. And thanks, Roger DeLeon, for joining us today. You really have been a great friend for quite a few years now. Uh, CDS in Texas, Pharma, and Superior Health Plan. And our top sponsors, uh, sort of our underwriting level sponsors are United Healthcare and Heart Inner Civic. And all those folks uh, have allowed us to um, really do this and do this as a, uh, a no cost service to, to people with disabilities and their family, their friends, their advocates, their caregivers, their providers throughout the state of Texas. And so we really appreciate them. And uh, I think that just about closes it. Uh, Laura or Chase, do you have any final remarks? Uh, this is Chase. I'll just wanted to let y'all know I was reading through some of the chat questions and um, I'll work through all of those and answer them as best I can and respond back to as many of y'all as I can. Uh, if you have any other questions, like we said in the survey, respond back to us and let us know and uh, we'll work on trying to work through all these issues and make sure we, we get past it. Thank you.